Now there's an election coming up, not here for us thankfully, not at least until May, but instead in the USA. Which means that the news is going to be full of opinion polls, telling us who is ahead, who is behind, who is up and who is down. Many of the opinion polls are commissioned by newspapers, but as well as the newspaper polls, the political parties have their own surveys. And they don't just ask what way you're planning on voting. They instead ask a raft of questions designed to establish the national mood. They want to know the issues that affect the ordinary voter. They want to know their concerns, but they also want to know silly things like their opinions on the candidate's clothes or their hairstyles. And if it is ever proven that 88% of people would vote for the candidate who wears purple trousers, then I can assure you that the very next appearance of that candidate, they will have their purple breeks on. The political parties want to know what you're saying about them, because if they keep the voters happy, they keep their job. It's amazing how easy it is to get an opinion these days. You can just throw a poll on Twitter and you'll get an answer to the burning issues of the day. Now, last night I did that and I asked about pineapple on a pizza. And it proved to be a close-fought contest and the comments were very divisive. It was almost like an election. And for a while, I took part in surveys for an online company that did marketing for a few companies. A car company and a brewery were two of them, and every couple of days, I would get asked my opinion on an advert. These adverts would be running, in fact some of them have run, and we'd talk about the design of a new product. So for every survey I completed, I would get a reward, 50p or a pound, it? It took a while, but eventually cashed out at 50 quid. The companies wanted to know in great detail which parts of the product I liked the best and seemed particularly interested in. Now I would like to think there'd be a chapel somewhere devoted to market researchers. They've got perhaps their own patron seat. And it turns out there was. There is. A patron saint of marketers, Saint Bernardine of Siena. And I would imagine this passage from Matthew's Gospel, asking who do they say I am, would be around the altar. But no, Saint Bernardine of Siena is the patron saint of marketing. His relics were, until 2009, located in the town of L'Aquila in Italy. So at the time of our reading, Jesus had been walking with his disciples, teaching, instructing as he went. He was spreading his message to all who would listen. And in a way that was similar to the politicians asking the pollsters, he asked what the people were saying about him. Well, a percentage of people think you're John the Baptist, or at least like John the Baptist, and... Some think you're the second coming of Elijah. Yet Jesus wasn't taking a poll. Jesus was trying to take the disciples to a deeper place. And that's why he turned to them and asked them a more penetrating question. Who do you say that I am? And that's when Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. So surely they should be promoting this. They should be sticking it on Facebook or Twitter or whatever they did back then. But instead Jesus tells the disciples, Hold your wish, be quiet. Keep it under your hats. But why? It's not just this once that Jesus wants his identity to keep a secret. Repeatedly throughout the Gospels, he tries to keep from becoming the talk of the town, or whatever town he happens to be in at that time. 
Yet when he performs such deeds as healing the sick and raising the dead and feeding the hungry, how are people expected to keep this to themselves? And why should they? Students of the Bible call this the messianic secret. And perhaps the best explanation is that he doesn't yet want to be seen as an easy fix to the earth's problems. The crowds will see him as someone to make their lives easier. A technician to sort out all the faults in their lives. And Jesus doesn't want to be acknowledged as the Messiah outside his death and resurrection. Because it's only in the light of those events that people can begin to recognise what his being the Messiah really means. If they hear he's the Messiah before he gets to the cross, they're sure to misunderstand him. They want a warrior leader, someone who'll throw off the Roman occupation. What they don't want is someone who can be defeated by the cross. And I think that even today people want an easy salvation, an easy solution to our problems, without us doing much in return. And for us today we can often be guilty of a cover-up of the messianic secret. We can be keen to dwell on Sunday school Jesus, healing, being nice, feeding thousands, without the darker part that it's through his death and resurrection and his overcoming of death, that we are saved. And we are to go down together with him and be saved too. We are members of the church, the one body with its different members. We have different gifts, according to the grace bestowed on us. But we are now responsible for bringing the Messiah to the world. If we are to call ourselves Christians, members of this church, then we'll accept the Messiah crucified and risen not 2,000 years ago, but risen in our own lives as well. And then, and only then, are we dealing with the real Jesus. But most importantly, we're not to keep the Messiah's secret to ourselves. The world still needs to hear. The world needs to know that we are not going to be silent. The world is waiting. So it's time for us to let the secret out. Amen. Let us come before God in prayer. May the Lord be exalted in every nation. May praise and thanksgiving be on the lips of those who love God. For the Lord looks kindly on the humble. And he is close, closer than we can sometimes imagine. He's holding us, guiding us, protecting us. With a love which endures forever and ever. Eternal One, we are so grateful that we can have a personal relationship with you through Christ Jesus. Christ the Messiah, the Son of the living God. We pray for those we know, the family, friends and neighbours who come to know Jesus too. We pray for the church in every nation to be guided, to reach out in love, to proclaim Jesus as Lord in word and actions. And we especially pray for the persecuted church in Algeria, Myanmar, Nigeria. May they feel the prayers of the worldwide church supporting them as they hold to affirm their faith. Faithful Lord, Even as your people turn from you, you remain faithful. And we praise and thank you for your faithfulness. Help us to be faithful and guide others struggling in their faith these days. May your Holy Spirit pour out to refresh the parched land of their souls. 
because you are the watering God. And may streams of your living water course across our land, bringing refreshment, cleansing, renewal. May it be rivers of justice and righteousness in a world hurting, for people struggling to hold those in power to account. Help us to trust in your plan and your mercy. Because we know, Lord God, that you are in charge. You are in control. And for that we offer you our praise and thanksgiving. As we bring our prayers to you, our Saviour and King, we offer the people, places and situations which are lying heavy in our hearts today. Lord, in your mercy, grace and love, accept these prayers offered in humility and love through Christ our Lord, Son of the living God, the Messiah. Amen. <laughs>